Hi there, and welcome to another interview today. I've got the fabulous Lisa with me, and I'm going to ask Lisa the question I ask every guest. Hey, Lisa, why did you become carnivore? Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me on. A um, bit of a long story. I suppose a lot of these stories do end up pretty long. People have health issues and so forth. When I was growing up, um, fairly standard Australian diet, meat, three veg, butter, cream, um, distinctly remember my dad always pouring cream over his ice cream to get that little crackly bit on the top that, you know, you have to kind of tap through. Um, so there was never any shortage of fats in our household. I was born in the 70s. So very soon after that, the whole diet culture kind of came in. Um, I was a pretty active child, danced a lot. And when I was 16, I um, auditioned for a professional show that was touring Asia and Japan. And I went away dancing at 16 um, for five years. So I worked in, um, in Japan, in Singapore, in South Korea, in like a cabaret style family review show. So we had the Can Can and Acrobats and all kinds of, of stuff in there, feathers and all of that. Um, so during that time, being so active, I really didn't think about my diet at all. Um, I know that the, um, you know, there was this kind of low fat movement and I suppose that was in the back of my head, but I wasn't really monitoring my own food. Having said that we were under quite a strict kind of, um, uh, like weight kind of parameter. And so we would get penalized. Um, if we were underweight or overweight. So we were given like a working weight, basically, which was like a couple of kilos range. Um, and I remember losing weight and being under that weight. Um, and it, it was absolutely terrible trying to put weight on. Um, and I think that that was the very last time in my life I've ever tried to put weight on. Um, it's always been the opposite. Um, so after that, um, anytime we, we put weight on during the show, while I was working overseas, we would do whatever diet was, you know, in the news or whatever. Um, I remember being on a watermelon diet for, um, I think we made it for three days before one of us almost passed out on stage. And so we were, you know, instructed to not do that anymore. But it was around the time of the Israeli army diet, you know, two days apples and two days chicken and two days cheese and that kind of thing. So um, a lot of kind of, you know, emphasis on, um, you know, restricting food intake and eating only these certain types of foods and making sure they were low fat and, and all of that. Um, having said that, I never really had a, a big problem with my weight until I came home and wasn't dancing anymore, had a knee surgery. So that, that kind of put me out of commission dance wise. And I decided to go back to uni or go to uni for the first time. Um, and over that period, I started to put weight on. I don't remember a specific time um, or instance where that, you know, kind of escalated. But I do know that by the time I had my first child, when I was 29, um, I think I'd put on something like 28 kilos with her. And um, I went to the uh, obstetrician and I said, oh, isn't that a bit much? And he said, oh, no, I'm not worried until you get to 30 kilos. And so, so to me, that was like, oh, cool, I've got leeway. So, um, yeah, I, I was very sick with both my pregnancies, vomiting and, um, you know, hyperemesis through the whole pregnancy, in and out of hospital on a drip. Um, so really wasn't eating well. I think the only kind of things that I could keep down were hot chips and, and pies and ice cream and things like that. So definitely not the kind of diet that I would want to have um, if I was pregnant again now. Um, so once I had my two children, I spent the next probably 15 years um, looking for a reason why I couldn't get back to my pre-pregnancy weight. So I tried many, many different diets, um, lots of different exercises. I was an aerobics instructor at the time. Um, I then was a Pilates instructor. I had 20 years teaching Pilates um, and I never seemed to be able to lose the amount of weight that I wanted to, to get back to my pre-pregnancy weight. Um, and I got really, really frustrated with this because I, a couple of reasons. I thought I was doing everything right. I was doing, you know, 
calorie restriction and I was I was um, doing a really a, like a stupid amount of exercise and um, you know all of these types of Weight Watchers and Easy Slim and the Michelle Bridges program and all of these kinds of things that um, that I tried and I'd, I'd have success initially but I would be starving the whole time um, and it really wasn't sustainable. And I never got to the to the point um, that I lost the amount of weight that I wanted to. So I started thinking, oh, maybe there's a medical reason. So maybe my thyroid's tanked, or maybe I, you know, some other kind of hormonal imbalance is causing this. So I started the search, and I know that this is like not uncommon. I know a lot of women of my age who have gone through this same process, um, spending hundreds of dollars on. Um, like holistic GPs trying to get answers for why they A, don't feel well and B, can't lose weight. So glutathione injections and hypnotherapy and um, all kinds of things um, I went through. And then in 2015, my husband was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So after that, he had done a lot of research. Uh, a few years prior to that, he had done um, seen himself in a photo and realized that he didn't like the way he looked so he'd gone low carb now what he thought was low carb at the time was just cutting out all the bread but he used to have like crackers every night and all that kind of thing so it wasn't really low carb it was lower carb but when he went um when he got diabetes he um became very serious about it and he went on a very strict ketogenic diet and um eliminated all markers of having diabetes so that was great he was no longer considered diabetic and this went on for probably 10 or 12 months, maybe 10 months. Um, and then his sugar started to rise again and we were like, what's going on? This isn't right. He's no less strict than he was before. Um, and then he was re-diagnosed as a type one larder diabetic. So latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, which is apparently not uncommon. Sometimes it's a misdiagnosis, but sometimes people can progress from type two to type one, apparently. So that was a bit of a turning point. And um, I had started dabbling in keto at this stage and I was um, initially quite successful, lost some weight and it was feeling great. That was the, the main thing. I was feeling really, really good. Um, I did get diagnosed with a hypothyroid um, condition, Hashimoto's hypothyroiditis. So I had elevated antibodies. Um, so I started taking a natural desiccated thyroid and a T3 supplement because I had very high reverse T3. And then um, after Pete, my husband, Peter, became a type 1 diabetic, we both started to be a lot stricter. I started getting into fasting a lot, um, was um, uh, one of the moderators for Jason Fung's fasting group um, back in the day, a long time ago now. Um, and started doing multi-day fasts. So I would, I would be keto in between and then I'd do a two-day fast and a three-day fast and five-day fast and I did a 10-day fast. And I think that the 10-day fast tanked me a little bit in the sense that I got a bit of fasting burnout. So I um, found it difficult to fast again after that. I had gone and done a couple of days, a couple of months separately um, of carnivore. And on the second time I did a 30-day carnivore um, kind of trial I actually started continuing after that and I had um, I had a set of bloods before I I went I'm, I'm very much into you know getting bloods and we have DEXA scans regularly and that kind of thing just to see what is actually going on um, and um, then yeah so I, I was kind of off for probably 18 months but my focus then was on losing weight and I really wasn't doing a lot of um, research about the science of carnivore and, and why it is a species appropriate human diet and that kind of thing. Um, I wanted to go back and do some kind of nutrition training or something like that. My husband did as well. But when we looked at the curriculum at the university, we found that it was at least five to 10 years behind. There was nothing about low carb diets, nothing about ketogenic diets. Um, and we really didn't want to put ourselves through three years of 
to come out with something that was already outdated. So we decided to go back and do biomedical science instead um, so that we could get a really good grounding in all of the science. And then hopefully by the time we finish, nutrition might have caught up a little bit and we could kind of go on to human nutrition after that. Um, so I was going along, you know, at uni, husband and I both doing the same degree, which is, um, which is fun. And then um, the second round of COVID came. So the first round of COVID, I don't know if you're aware of how it was um, in Perth, but I'm sure it wasn't that different in the UK. We um, had a couple of big lockdowns um, and the government were really quite strict. And so there was, you know, very little opportunity to go out and do anything. And, and, and that was fine. I actually coped with the first lockdown really well. By the time we had that second round in early 2021, um, having previously in my 20s been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, I had been um, taking medication for most of the intervening years since my 20s and what was what now my late 40s. Um, and I think I got to the second round of lockdowns and just was overcome with the futility of it all and, you know, just fell in a bit of a hole and, and stopped being carnivore or keto and um, just started eating whatever I wanted. So I very quickly put on over the next, gosh, it would have been about 12 months, um, about 15 kilos. And while the weight, it was unwanted, what was even worse was my mental health started to really tank. Um, it all came to a head in November 2022. Um, I had a job um, in the hospital. I'd been working for a laboratory and then I was working in the, um, the cardiology department of a major hospital, um, but there wasn't a lot of work for me. And I'm someone who likes to keep busy and learn things. And I just, I came home from work one Friday night and started crying. And by Sunday, I was still crying and I just could not stop. So I had um, an admission to a psych hospital for 10 days um, <clears throat> which was actually exactly what I needed. Um, and it gave me a little bit of perspective. And when I got out, I thought, you know, I really want to feel well again. I knew that physically I wasn't um, in good shape. Um, I found it difficult to get up and down off the floor. And, and that had never happened to me before. As an ex-dancer and a Pilates instructor, I'm up and down all the time. But I was finding it really difficult to do even just very basic tasks like, you know, kneel down on the ground and get back up again. Um, and with the, the kind of insult to my mental health at that time, I, I reflected when I got home, like, when was the last time you felt really well? Um, and really, it was when I was last following the carnivore diet. So I tried, I thought, oh, maybe going straight to carnivore is a bit of a stretch because I'm still coming off a standard Australian diet. So I um, thought I'll go keto first and then ease into it. Now I've learned a lot about myself. I'm not a moderator at all. I am an abstainer. And so I tried and I would be keto or carnivore for half the day. And then I would just fail in the afternoon and I just couldn't maintain it. So then I decided just after Christmas um, that there's no point in trying to segue through keto into carnivore. I'm just going to go hardcore kind of, well, relatively hardcore carnivore straight off the bat. So that's what I did on the 28th of December last year. Um, so I'm back on carnivore, feeling amazing, 15 kilos down. I no longer have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. My antibodies are normal, so I've been able to ditch my medication. Um, I'm still taking medication for depression and anxiety. I'm hesitant to drop that just yet, um, considering I had a hospitalisation. So I'm, I'm just kind of taking that easy. But um, I, am, I am feeling just like a superhero compared to how I was before. I have energy. I, I have a new job that I've been at for nearly six months. I have a great team. Um, yeah, I, I, it would take a long page to list all the, the benefits that I've had aside from the weight loss. And I think the difference between this time 
carnivore and last time carnivore was my focus. So my focus last time was purely how can I lose weight? So I think that I was possibly restricting eating. I was, um, you know, not giving myself what I needed. Now I'm really trying to eat much more intuitively. So I will have days where I fast and I'll have days where I'm hungry from the moment I get up. So I'll eat. Um, and, and I think that that has made a really big difference. And the focus now being on my vitality and my mental health, along with the weight loss, um, has really changed it for me. Yeah. So, sorry, long oh. story. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's amazing. I'm packed with very interesting information. Um, and there's... I take my hat, hat off to you because that was very coherent and uh, oh, linear <laughs> and chronological. It was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. So for people that don't know, I don't know Lisa at all. And uh, we just contacted online. So that story was new to me as well. Um, and and qu quite a common story. You know, we're all different, but, you know, you do different diets to other people. I, I've, I've had so many of these success stories and, and people mention different types of diet the watermelon diet heard of you're the first person that experienced it and as a dancer yeah if you're on that three days later someone is going to pass out on stage I mean, absolutely nothing in a melon that's going to keep you going um so i think I, if i if you don't mind i would just like to take one little detour to talk about your your husband pete because sure amongst all your details we've got you here you see he's not here mm. so um you said that he was diagnosed as type two, thought he was doing low carb, then he went ketogenic. That seemed to be all right. Mm. And then he was diagnosed or re-diagnosed as or correctly diagnosed as type one. So, so what That's did right. they base what did they base that on then? So they did all of the antibody tests. I think there's two or three antibody tests for type one. Um, and he maxed them out. And the the um uh endocrinologist said, Oh quick, we better get you some insulin. And Pete was like, I'm fine. I feel fine. Like, you know, steady. And um, so he managed to get some insulin and, you know, did a bit of research about it. He's very scientifically minded. And, um, and he was like, you know, the insulin is actually what causes all the problems. So without having that full understanding as, as he and I both do now, um, he was like, you know, the, the higher the insulin goes, the more people are losing limbs and losing their eyesight and having, you know, peripheral neuropathies and all these kinds of things that happen due to the impact of insulin. Um, so he's like, okay, what I want to do is try and minimise the amount of insulin that I have to have. And the only way I can do that is by moderating my diet. So he's actually kept a spreadsheet since 2015, which documents every single thing he's eaten and the quantities and the macros, every vitamin or mineral he's taken, every, excuse me, bit of exercise that he's done, everything, the sleep he has, and he checks his blood glucose every hour and his ketones and so forth, ketones only occasionally now. Um, because he wants to see what effect all of these different foods have on his blood sugar and, and how he can minimize his insulin. So I'm not sure exactly how much he's taking now, but I know that um, a regular type one diabetic is taking upwards of 80 to 120 units per day. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I don't know off the top of my head, but I suspect that his is kind of 20 or less. Um, so he's managed to keep it really, really low, which is amazing. Um, he wants to be around for a long time. Obviously we've got children and lives. Um, so, you know, if that's the price he has to pay, um, then yeah, that's what he wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. So the last question on Pete, and maybe we'll get him on, I don't know, but, um, what are the foods that he sort of identified? Just for people that so, are listening, I'm not um, sure. Obviously, all of the like all of the carbohydrates, whether they're simple or complex carbohydrates, they all have an effect on on glucose. So he's cut all of those out. His diet basically consists of mainly carnivore, 
Um, but he does have occasionally some tomato. He'll have some berries occasionally. So it's kind of like what you would call a ketovore diet, I suppose. Um, so I'm actually a little bit more strict than him in, at, in the interim now because I have a few goals that I want to hit. Um, but for him, he, um, he makes this concoction called keto fluff, which is essentially the, like the inside of a cheesecake. And it's made from cream, cream cheese, sour cream, double cream, and a little bit of sweetener and cocoa powder or something. And it is amazing. Um, and so I think I got the idea off someone on Facebook or Instagram back of like five, six years ago, and he's just kind of adapted it to, to suit his own taste. Um, so, yeah, he, he has that, but, but mostly meat, meat and eggs. And, yeah, uh, yeah that's basically it. Yeah, a little bit yeah, of other stuff. Thank you for that. So, yeah, going back to you. Because you're the star here. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to just, I wrote some notes. I'm just going to pick through each each one that I found very interesting. Well, it was all very interesting to be, to be frank. Um, you know, you mentioned that you had high reverse T3, which is interesting mm -hmm. because I'm always trying to get people to get their uh, reverse T3 um, checked. So firstly, mm -hmm. well done for doing that. Thank um, you. I had to <laughs> <laughs> for the For the people watching, why is that an issue then? High reverse T3. Okay, so, so reverse T3. So when you're um, you have your thyroid gland, it releases um, T. I think it releases T4. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, or releases T. Your pituitary releases TSH. Yep. And stimulates your thyroid to release T4, which is not an active hormone. It needs to be converted to T3. So the T3. Um, form is active and sometimes there can be a bit of uh like miscommunication through the this cellular process and it it um is translated into reverse t3 which is an inactive form of t3 so what they found was that my reverse t3 was very very high which means that the t3 hormone is not able to be utilized by your body so the effects that a the, the T3 hormone normally has um, on, you know, your temperature regulation and your metabolism and your feelings of well-being and all of those things, it can't actually, your body can't access reverse T3. It hasn't got the receptors to actually absorb it into the cell. So you won't get any of those benefits. So um, yeah, when you've got high reverse T3, you need to supplement, um, potentially supplement T3 as well as T4. If you're only supplementing T4 and you've got this dodgy process where things are being converted into reverse T3, you're not going to find any benefit from only supplementing T4. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, brilliant. And for those people that are listening, I mean, if I've got a biomedical student uh, or expert <laughs> online, I'm going to ask them. And just just to just to clarify for people that are still not sure it really exists, it really does exist. And you can see the molecular structure. And if you imagine a square, there's there's four T4 is called that because there's four iodines, uh, one, two, three, four in a sort of square and uh, T3 that's active, it's one, two, three. And then um, with reverse T3, you've got three, but it's one, two, and it's on the other corner. Simple as that, really simple as that. It is reversed and mm. it causes huge problems. Um, interesting that you worked with Jason Fung's fasting group as a moderator, but you went mm. too far, you feel. 10 days was, was too much, you felt, a 10-day fast. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I think that... Um, the idea of a 10-day fast was what was appealing um, mm -hmm. because I am the kind of person that wants to push myself and I want to, you know, I, I, I've frequently been described as an overachiever. Um, so I, I, I think that I just, I got to five days and I'm like, oh, five days, that was easy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do 10. Um, and I think that um, Although I felt incredible and I had bloods at the beginning, in the middle and at the end, I had a dexter at the beginning at the and at the end just to see what the um, effect was on my visceral fat and my bone density and my muscle mass, all of these markers were things that I was keeping an eye on. Um, I did come off the back of that feeling like I didn't want to fast again for quite a while. Um, and 
Yeah, I, I haven't really got back to the multi-day fast. I have been playing around with OMAD a little bit lately, um, but because I'm only early days, I'm only six months in, I do want to give my body time to figure things out without trying to muck around with it too much. Um, I'm just trying to listen to my body, eat when I'm hungry. Um, if I'm not hungry, I won't eat. But if I am fasting and trying to do it, having a nomad day, for example, and I get to halfway through the day and I'm ravenous, I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to push it because I know that my history of dieting has screwed up my, you know, my leptin and ghrelin and all of these things that, you know, I want to get them back in the, in the working and functioning in the right way so that this can be kind of lasting a lasting result and a lasting way to live yeah it's getting getting the balance right with the fasting i mean i, I yeah. find the sweet spot for me is 72 hours for people that are surprised mm. you said you got to five days and you thought wow i could go forever that, i mean that's really common actually and that's why people can do these extended mm. fasts um i mm. you know this is just information and education it's not it's not medical advice but i would just say you know if you're underweight don't fast and if you need to gain weight certainly don't fast and there's other situations where you shouldn't really fast I think pregnancy is another one because you've got to think you're getting nutrients into your body to build stuff so when you hear about the therapeutic benefits of fasting which there definitely are like autophagy um if your body is also trying to build some structures and there's no nutrients so it is a striking a balance but for most people adding uh you know intermittent fasting you know just restricted time feeding so it's there's many different ways to do it that was that was really interesting that you work with jason fung's group there because i think yeah. talking about fasting he's possibly the main man um and i think the carnivore uh, carnivore um way of eating is mm. something that's helped people with their mental health very much and i, I thought that was interesting Obviously, we're in a real weird sort of post restriction period where a lot of people are saying those restrictions. And I would say New Zealand and Australia, the clients I've had from there, I've said it was particularly brutal. Um, so I don't think you're alone there where people said, well, the first one, not too bad. But the second one was just, you know, yeah. tipping me over the edge. So I think, um, was there particular influences that, that made you look at carnivore or did you just sort of read up yourself? What happened? The first person that I knew that was doing a carnivore diet was a gentleman called John Clary, who was a, also a moderator in Jason Fung's group. Um, and he was doing fasting as well. And he's been extremely successful with fasting and he's still carnivore. And he was the first one who I noticed wasn't eating any vegetables. And I was kind of, I was very curious. I was like, hang on, he's, you know, he's not doing what the rest of us are doing. He's doing the fasting, but he's not doing the vegetables. And, and so I kind of just kept an eye on, you know, the things that he was posting and we would chat in our little moderator group and, and all that kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, I, I'd say that he was the first one I found out about and from there um, found, um, you know, Paul Saladino and Sean Baker and a number of other people. Um, Anthony Chafee is in my town. He's in Perth, um, WA as well. So I've been um, listening to his podcasts on repeat, um, yeah, for a while. Um, so I, I actually intersperse his and yours because I live about half an hour away from the hospital. So I'll listen to him on the way to work and you on the way home from work. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that's actually one of my tips. You know, I know that you asked this at the end of the show, but I think that when you're starting in a carnivore diet or way of eating or lifestyle or whatever you want to call it, it's really important to surround yourself with the carnivore community. And if you if you've just decided oh this is what i want to do and then you try and do it but you haven't given yourself any support i think that it's much much more challenging what i did was every time i get in the car i put a podcast on it's a carnival podcast i'm constantly getting that information that helps me reinforce my belief in what we're doing and that support, even though it's not a face-to-face -face thing and it's not a group necessarily, I'm still immersing myself, I guess, in the carnivore community and the carnivore culture 
so that I can learn more and become, you know, just more, more kind of satisfied and happy with the choices that I'm making um, and, you know, maybe change my mind about a few things and just, it just gives you that little bit of moral support, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good point. I'm always telling people it's difficult because you're saturated with such bad information from the multi, you know, from the mainstream media, mm. basically. So, mm. and it's very pernicious. It gets into you if you're hearing this, that, and the other constantly. Mm. Even if you feel like you're ignoring it, it's out there, mm. and then your family, friends, social groups, whatever, you will hear things that do not align with the. Tr- well, what I call the truth, basically, which is what is the species appropriate diet. And I think the longer I've done this, I mean, you know, I've had loads of clients, I'm just 100% convinced. But of course, I'm constantly exposed to people like yourself, who have got better on carnivore. But it's not an echo chamber, because I've lived outside of this echo chamber. And I can remember when I was a personal trainer, and it was all high carb, somebody losing seven pounds was a huge cause for celebration, but really getting people off their meds never really happened. Um, it just, it just didn't happen. The things that happen on carnival didn't happen in my life for 35 years of being out there, um, believing in high carb and low fat and uh, avoiding cholesterol. So I've had nine years of this now and it, it, you're right. Mm. I, I, I think if you're not in this sort of, sphere and you're just an individual there and your family may be not supporting you just listening to the podcast listening to the doctors listening to the common sense of it to be honest and looking mm-hmm. at the people and the, and um, the success stories i think is amazing um so you still teach pilates or are you now doing just the clinical trial assistant work so now i'm just in clinical trials um i mm. taught pilates for 20 years and i um i'm still an educator for pole star pilates which is one of the the leading pilates education institutions worldwide so i've had um, 10 or 12 years of training other pilates instructors so physios and and chiros and other people come in and want to add pilates to their modality and their repertoire so um i was doing doing that for quite some time um i haven't been teaching for the last 18 months or so um life has been very busy we're renovating a house i've got uh, a son going through year 11 um which is, I don't know what that is, whether that's O levels or A levels where you are, but it's the second last year to graduating high school. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm working full time and yeah, life, life gets busy. So no Pilates for me at the moment. I can't say I won't ever go back, but, um, but at the moment I'm really enjoying my, my role in clinical trials. It's, um, it's challenging and it's very rewarding. So yeah, I'm liking that. So um, you're, do you set up trials but are involved in, say, nutrition, for instance? No, unfortunately, don't have anything to do with nutrition. So at the moment, the trials department that I'm in is haematology trials. So we deal with um, new medications for uh, people with any type of blood cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, that kind of thing. And um, we run trials for different medications that are coming out. So we will have the patients from our hospital that will get referred to the trial. Um, they'll go through a screening process and then they'll, um, if they pass the screening process, they'll get admitted to the trial and they'll start on the trial drug um, as part of their process of, of treating their cancer. Now, oh yeah, it was admirable work. And now on your Instagram, you say you're a biomedical science nerd. If you're in the industry, so to speak, of doing clinical trials, do you find time to look at clinical trials uh, that talk about carnivore or low carb? Well, I actually, I'm very keen to get something going myself. Um, After I finish this degree, um, I'm planning on doing honours and then I'd like to do a PhD looking at the carnivore diet. Um, maybe the carnivore diet is first line therapy for diseases of hyperinsulinemia. Um, I have spoken to my academic chair and the Australian Phenome Centre, which is associated with Murdoch University in WA, is interested um, in my project. So we're hoping to set up honours as a small portion of the PhD so that it just leads into the PhD. 
Um, but that's going to be a little while in the future. Um, but yeah, I am interested in any, any studies that I can get my hands on. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, there's not a role for us to um, have any dietary input into the studies, although I did notice um, with some of the drugs, it, um, they, uh, they can be taken with, they do mention that they can be taken with a low fat meal or a high fat meal. So, um, you know, I just found that they, they might have had a look at some diet. So I don't know what that would lead to. But um, yeah, I have to have to bite my tongue when I'm talking to patients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that is the problem. And I, I, I did my physiology and health science honours degree. And a big part of mm. that was looking at studies. And I will say of, of all the uh, education I've gone through, that was at least a little bit more honest. And they, they talked about confirmation bias and they talked about reporting and the data and the conclusion mm -hmm. sometimes don't seem yeah. to match. So I think I think. Um, people are aware that they can be manipulated slightly. And it got me incredibly interested in statistics because mm -hmm. the way they um, present the data to make it palatable to like the, yes. the lay person, the statistical uh, manipulation of the power of certain things is quite, Absolutely. quite frightening. Yeah. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that because it's really your story. So um You've already beat me to the uh, bit, bit of advice for people who are on the fence. Well, that's fine. I, I agree with you. Su support is a really big part of um, succeeding in this way. Mm. But mm. I'd like to keep mm. keep the door open to speak to you in like six months or a year's time and see you getting on and to be really good. Don't that know if you want to get your husband on to have a chat at some oh, point. Yeah. That would yeah. be interesting. And you're yeah, just up the road from Chafee, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in my town. We have a um, we had a, a carnival meetup um, a month or so ago that he came to. So yeah, it was good. It was good meeting him. And yeah, yeah. he's very supportive. I, I mean, yeah. I would have to say, yeah. in the carnival space, he's one of the most generous people with his time mm. and his knowledge. Absolutely. So, uh, and I keep that's saying right. that. Yeah. Um, that 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 that's a much, sorry. Go on. Sorry, I was going to say that one of the the things that I like about him is that he's constantly looking to be proven wrong. Um, and you mentioned about confirmation bias, and that is obviously, you know, something that we all need to be aware of. Um, but he is very interested in, you know, looking at what other people think so that he can, you know, make sure that he's saying the right thing. And I think that that's, that's really good. And, and if he gets something wrong, he'll say he's got it wrong, which is, it's, you know, shows he has integrity. So, you know, I appreciate that about him and, and about you and about, you know, Sean and, and all of the, the main people. So yeah, it's, um, I think it's a really good community. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're confident in your position, that doesn't mm. mean you can be arrogant with it and you've always got to be open. And the, your argument becomes stronger if you are prepared to look at the other side uh, of the argument or whatever um, um, proposition because that's, that's, how you, that's how you grow, isn't it? Because you might right. find something that you thought, yeah, I can't think of the top of my head, something I thought that, that has changed. Well, let's look at 35 years of thinking high carb worked. You know, it's a yeah, long exactly. period of time. Yeah. And sadly, Absolutely. it took being ill for me to wake up. You know, it took me personally having problems. Yes. I mean, you said the same that sort of yeah. similar thing. It's, it's when it happens to you, you start to mm. query. Um, you know, you couldn't lose the Absolutely. pregnancy weight. Yeah. Why is that? I'm eating less, mm. I'm moving more, I'm restricting calories. I'm doing all the things that are mm. right. And you're bound to mm. bound to que uh, query it if it's not working. Yeah. But anyway, Lisa, thank you so yes. much. I really appreciate it. So I hope you're still listening to because after we finished recording, uh, Lisa came up with a bit of interesting information with an experiment she's doing. So Lisa, could you just give us this little bonus thing that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So anytime we do, my husband and I want to, you know, do an experiment, we get our bloods taken, we get a DEXA scan, which is the full body kind of MRI style scan that looks at your visceral fat, um, your adipose tissue and your muscle mass and your bone density and all these other kinds of markers. Um, and so I had a DEXA scan on the, I think it was early October last year. And then I just had my recent one, so my six month scan uh, last week. And it showed that I had, um, oh, 
for that six months, I haven't done any significant exercise. So I I walk, uh, you know, walk the dogs. I walk a little bit to the lab and back at work, um, but I hadn't been doing any Pilates to speak of and I hadn't been doing any weight training or, you know, kettlebell work or anything like that. So I decided that that first six months I was going to do no exercise. So I was going to have a look at what happened in, in my DEXA scan. And then the next six months I will add in some exercise and then we can see what the results are in six months time. So it was interesting. I'd lost a, a significant amount of, of fat mass. Um, I think uh, it was upwards of 10, eight, uh, nine or 10 kilos of fat mass. Um, I'd lost a little bit of muscle mass, which was... Um, understandable given that I hadn't really done any exercise and I am aging um, but what I found really interesting was that I had marginally increased my bone density now bone density in a woman of 51 is supposed to be on the decline so the fact that I didn't do any weight bearing exercise to speak of yet I still had a noticeable increase in bone density I found really really interesting so I'm really keen to see what will happen in this next six months. Um, yeah, so watch this space.